Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's event here at Princeton Public Library in our virtual home on Crowdcast, where we've been doing author talks and other events for over a year now, and we're so glad that you can join us here tonight as we welcome a local author to talk about her memoir that she wrote called Hidden in Berlin, and I'm going to introduce her in just a moment. Uh, just a few little housekeeping things before we get going. My name is Janie Herman, and I am the Adult Programming Manager at Princeton Public Library. And uh, we will be having lots of other events here in this space come the fall. We're going to slow down a little bit for the summer, but check back from time to time. We do have a few events coming up in June and July, but not as many as we normally do. We're going to be outside a lot this summer, especially out at the Princeton Shopping Center, as we do uh, take our, our, our programming outside to offer you some music some bands, some films, and other events. And so we hope you'll be joining us as we, we move outside to enjoy the better weather. Uh, if you want to purchase tonight's book, I've included the link right there. You can see it says Buy Hidden in Berlin at this link. That will take you right there. And I would encourage you to do so and to support the author. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we will do Q&A at the end of the event. And uh, there is a little uh, button there that says ask a question. Just go ahead and type it in there. And if you're in the audience, you can upvote it. Oh, I see we have somebody tuning in all the way from Ohio. Thank you, Linda. And we have other people saying hello. Feel free to chat in the chat and, and tell us where you're from. And I think other than that, we are ready to go with the event. I was just giving it a few minutes for everybody to log on. So let me introduce tonight's author, Evelyn Joseph Grossman, who was raised quite near us here in Princeton in Trenton, New Jersey, by parents who couldn't separate themselves from their German past or their German accents. She grew up in a home that celebrated Jewish holidays, a connection she continues today as an active member of the Jewish Center of Princeton. Uh, she earned a bachelor's degree from Douglas College of Rutgers University and a master's degree from Fordham. In her professional life, she worked as a financial analyst in the field of commercial debt obligations. In retirement, she is focused on writing her parents' story, honoring the rescuers as righteous among the nations, nations doing volunteer work in social service programs in Trenton, going on bike rides with her husband, Lenny, and taking trips to California to visit her grandkids. So with that being said, and I see we have a nice crowd gathering us here online, let me welcome Evelyn to our event. Hi, Evelyn, welcome. We're so glad that you're here tonight. So I'm gonna be here with you. I'm gonna be in the background running the slides and controlling the event, but I'll join you at the end again for the Q&A. So I'm gonna make myself disappear and let you take it away. Thank you, Janie. Thank you, Janie, and the Princeton Public Library for inviting me here this evening as part of the Jewish American Heritage Month. Thank you to all of you who signed up for this event and for being here with me this evening. Before talking about my book, I want to say that I've been watching the terrible events in Israel, the destruction, the casualties, and the loss of so many lives. But today, there is good news. Israel and Hamas have agreed to a ceasefire that is scheduled to take effect at 2 a.m. Israeli time, which is right now, which is 7 p.m. in Princeton, and that is a reason for celebration. The lessons from the Holocaust must be remembered. Israel must exist and continue as a Jewish state, and when attacked, Israel has the right to defend itself. At this moment, um, I would like to tell you about my book. Janie, slide one. Yeah, okay, I'll be bringing it right up. Hang on a moment, share screen. Thank you. Okay, this is the cover of the book, Hidden in Berlin. And what you see there, these are my parents. Uh, this is their wedding picture. It is March 29th, 1947, less than two years after the war. It is in Berlin. Mom is dressed very stylishly in her fur coat and wide brimmed hat and sandals. And my father is looking serious but smiling and they are a happy newly married couple. This book was published in December of 2020. And I was thrilled that my mom who was then 97 years old could hold the book in her hand. 12 weeks later on February 22nd of this year, mom passed away. She was remarkably strong and had lived independently until the last few weeks of her life. Today, tonight, she is here with me as I tell you the story. 
The book is based on conversations with my mom and recorded on the tape recorder over many years. It is based on letters that my father wrote to the people who helped find him shelter. It is based on notes from my father's brother, my uncle Gerhard, who escaped Nazi Germany and came to America in 1938. It is based on research that I did at the Yad Vashem and the International Tracing Service. And it is based on trips that I took back to Germany to see the places where my parents lived and where they hid during the war. And the book also gives tribute to the Germans who saved, there were two sets of Germans as you'll understand soon. It pays tribute to those Germans who saved both my mother and my father and they were honored as, 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 as righteous among the nations. Next slide, please, Janie. All right. So this book is really the story. It begins as the story of two separate families, my father's family and my mother's family. This is a picture of my father's family, the Joseph family. Um, my grandparents are Berta and Leopold Joseph, and they're two boys. Ernst, who is my father, is in the back. Gerhard is his brother, about a year and a half older. It is around 1926 and they, ha they are vacationing on the Baltic Sea. This picture breaks my heart. It is a beautiful picture. It is a picture of a family having a wonderful time, having no idea what the future will hold. In 1933, when Hitler comes to power, my father then is in his first year of university and my, my uncle has finished um, and he wants to do graduate school. Jews cannot remain in Germany at the university. Both my father and Gerhard go to Switzerland to study. They are there for a year about when a telegram comes from, from their mother saying that their father had a heart attack and she wants the boys to return back to Berlin. They do. My father begins working with his father at the, at the business, which was in um, uh, a business that imported canned fish, tuna and sardines and mackerel and sold them to retailers throughout Berlin. My uncle is able to secure a visa and he uh, comes to America in 1938. Um, that's a whole story how he's able to find a sponsor and stay, but he does find somebody and he is able to um, stay in Trenton, New Jersey actually. In 1938, it is Kristallnacht, at that the, break, the night of broken glass. My father and my grandfather are arrested that night and my grandmother sends a telegram to her older son to Gerhard asking for money to help get them out. Gerhard sends the money, the boys are released. Things rapidly get worse. My, father is, my grandfather was forced to sell his business. My father begins construction work. Soon after that, um, my father is forced to do what they call Svangsarbeit, forced labor for Siemens. Siemens is a huge multinational company that still exists today. And at that time, they were manufacturing electric equipment that they sold to the German government. They paid Jews and others very low wages, sold the equipment to the German, which was of course a, a very profitable arrangement for Siemens. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, this slide, maybe we can make it a tiny bit bigger, Janie, in, if that's possible. Thank you. This is a, a, a this is a cardboard of about three inches by five inches, and it's called a Polizeilich Erlaubnis, a police permission slip. To get to Siemens, my father had to ride the S-Bahn, the train. Now, this was issued in 1942. At this time, Jews were identified clearly by the yellow star with Yuda written on it, which they had to wear on the outside of their coats. So everyone knew they were Jewish. To but this card went even further. What it says on the first line, it says, Dein Juden, Ernst Joseph, Ernst Israel Joseph, the Jew, Dein Juden, Ernst Israel Joseph. My father's name was Ernst Joseph. Israel was never a part of his name. It was added by the Nazis to all, Israel was added to the name of all Jewish men, just as Sarah was added to the name of all Jewish women. So this card gave my father permission to ride the Esban from his home to, to Siemens. On the bottom of this, of this card, you can see the iconic um, eagle on top of the swastika.
during this time, after 19, during this time, um, my uncle had sent an affidavit to, um, to the German consulate with uh, trying to get his parents and his brother to get out of Berlin into America. However, the U.S. quota, the U.S. immigration quota was very restricted and there were so many more people who wanted to leave Germany than were allowed to come in. And there was no way that, th th that they were able to leave. My father realized that they were trapped. There was no way they were going to escape Germany. And he began looking for shelter, not just for himself, but shelter for his parents as well as himself. Through a friend at the marketplace, he was introduced to a German couple. Their names are Laney and, Laney and Paul Pisarius. Next slide, please. Okay. Laney and Paul Pisarius are an ordinary German couple. Middle, um, they were a middle-class couple. Paul grew up outside of Berlin. He, uh, he was trained as a carpenter. His father, he was one of eight children. His father was a builder. He served in World War I in the Great War. And after he came home from that war, he worked um, delivering goods throughout to stores in Berlin. He drove a uh, horse and carriage. And through the marketplace, he, somebody else knew him. They knew that he was strongly anti-Nazi, hated Hitler, as, and his wife did as well. And so this friend suggested to my father, perhaps these people could help you. Um, next slide, please. Paul Pisarius and Laney lived on Eisenbahnstrasse 15, which is in the Kreuzberg section of Berlin, near the center of Berlin. This picture, the house, the picture on the left is the house where they were in hiding. It was not taken during the war. It was taken in 2011 when I went back to Berlin with my husband, Lenny, and with my mother. Um, the house... The, ha the house, as you see there, they lived on the first floor on the, uh, a basement apartment in a small room, roughly 10 feet by 10 feet. The house was what they called a hinter house, which means it wasn't directly on the street. It was in the courtyard behind the street. The picture on the right is Eisenbahnstrasse, what the street looked like when we were there in 2011. Now, when you go and hide and you cease to exist, that means whatever ration cards the German government gave you before, you could no longer have. Laney and Paul had rations cards, two cards for themselves, but that was not nearly enough to feed five people. So my father left that small room frequently to go out on the street to look for food for his family. But going out on the street was extremely dangerous. Young men who were, quest were stopped frequently and asked for their papers. If my father had been stopped, that would have been, he would have been deported. He also went out on the street to see the girl that he loved, Lila. Next slide, please. My mother's family was the Jacobi family. Her father was Bruno Jacobi, and her mother was Ella Jacobi. On the left, you can see Bruno. He had served in the Great War and earned the Iron Cross First Class, of which he was extremely proud, and he wore the the lapel, in his lapel, he wore the pin. He believed his patriotism, his service to the German government would save his family. For a short while, it did. I have, unfortunately, I have no pictures of my grandmother, Ella Jacobi, so, uh, but I do have a few pictures of my mother's brother. In the middle is her brother, Hans Martin, on his first day of school. It was typical for um, for parents to give their children a shulte, a, a big cone filled with candy on their first day of school. And there you can see Hans Martin standing there very proudly on, on his first day of school. The picture on the right is also Hans Martin, the last picture we have of him, and I suspect he was around 21 or 22 of that picture. Next slide, please. The picture on the left is my mother. Um, she's Lilo. Her name was Elizabeth Charlotte Lena Jacobi. However, those four names were way too much for her, so most all her friends and family called her Lilo. Lilo, my mom, loved to dance, and she dreamed of becoming a ballerina, and there you could see her on the picture on the left. She and her brother were absolutely the best of buddies, whether it's swimming or hiking or ice skating, they were always together. They, um, they, 
1933, when my father, when, when the laws came that Jews couldn't stay in school, my mother could actually stay for one extra year. That was an accommodation given to the children of the veterans of World War I that only lasted for one year. After that, she was, at that time, she was going to the school, the Bismarck Lyceum. And at that school, she became friends with a girl named Ava Kassira, who becomes extremely important in the story. After that, after 1934, mom could no longer stay there and then had to go to a Jewish school for one year, the Lesler Shula. And even after that one year, um, there was no more school. Kristallnacht came and my mother has many memories of seeing the synagogues being burned and um, people be being beaten on the street. Uh, my mother also had to work at Siemens as forced labor. There were many Siemens throughout um, Berlin. It wasn't just one place. My father was in uh, a Siemens called Siemensstadt, which was on the northern, the northwestern part of Berlin, and my mother was at a different Siemens. They did not know each other at that time. In 1941, the deportation started coming. Uh, people started being taken away from Berlin, and uh, uh, they were started to be brought to the camps. So, oh, excuse me, be, before that, um, before my, before that, excuse me, I forgot something. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, oops, one back, please. My mother's Jewish education my, uh, came primarily from this rabbi, Rabbi Joachim uh, Prince, there he is. Rabbi Prince was a very charismatic rabbi in Berlin who, um, who spoke of the threat of Hitler. He, he realized his, his, the congregants in Berlin, who were very assimilated Jews, did not, did not feel the threat. But Rabbi Prince had grown up in the suburbs outside of Berlin and saw the danger of, of, of Hitler, and he tried to warn his congregants. Rabbi Prince had also an amazing influence on the young people of Berlin. He invited teenagers, young people, to come to his house on Shabbat for meals and to play ball and to, and to sing Hebrew songs. And through Rabbi Prince, mom, mom developed a love of Judaism and she learned the prayers and she learned to read Hebrew. Rabbi Prince's words and his sermons attracted the attention of the Nazis. And in 1937, he left Berlin he came to America and became the rabbi of a synagogue in Newark, um, B'nai Abraham, and also became extremely involved with the civil rights movement. He became friends with, with Martin Luther King, and he was there in 1963 on the March on Washington. Rabbi Prince at that time stood up and gave a speech talking about the biggest danger is silence, that, that silence is a, the biggest danger in terms of um, a bigotry. Immediately after Rabbi Prince sat down, Martin Luther King stood up and gave his iconic I Have a Dream speech, which is remembered a bit more than uh, Rabbi Prince's speech. After Rabbi Prince left, which was in 1937, and it's not that things are um, increasingly becoming very difficult for everyone and, and all the Jews in Berlin. My, my grandfather loses his job. My mother begins working as long as her brother at different places. I want to read you right now a, a little bit from my book about what happens then. Deportations from Berlin began in October 1941 with the first trains headed for the Lotz ghetto in Poland. Through the remaining months of the year, about 10,000 Jews were deported from Berlin to camps and ghettos in Lotz and Riga, Latvia. Those remaining in Berlin did not know the fate of their relatives and friends. If they knew, some might have tried to resist. Others might have attempted suicide. The SS created the illusion that Jews were being brought to work camps. Bruno expected he and Ella, Ella would face physical labor, which would not be easy for a man of 63 and a woman of 64. The best he could hope for was to remain strong until the war ended, until Hitler was defeated. He never imagined the truth. Lilo and Hans Martin were at work that day in September 1942 when the Gestapo came to their house. Bruno and Ella were not as fortunate. The Gestapo walked in the same way they came to every other house. They knocked on the door. They entered with orders for Bruno and Ella to pack their suitcase for resettlement in the East. 
When Lilo and Hans Martin returned home, they found the front door sealed and a note posted ordering them to report to the deportation center on Grossa Hamburger Strasse. Lilo shut her eyes to stop the tears. She wiped her face and gently repeated the words her parents said so often. If they come for us, don't worry, we will be back. When this terrible time is over, we'll, we'll be together again. Rosa Hamburger Strasse was the location of the Jewish old age home. It was converted to a, a holding center, a place where Jews were brought before they were taken away on the train. train. When my mom and her brother saw that note to come to Rosa Hamburger Strasse, they did not obey. Instead, they went to their nana, their, uh, Clara Pashka, who was the nanny who used to take care of them, who was a friend who was not Jewish. She took them into her home. However, after a few weeks there, her house was bombed. And then mom and her brother could no longer stay there. They started just walking streets, looking for different places to hide, different people to stay with. They would spend time apart and try to reconnect. There was one time in February of 1943 when my mother no longer sees her brother and she does not know what happens to him. She is walking on the street when she has absolutely no money, no food, no place to hide, and not having, and is desperate when she hears somebody call out her name. She hears somebody call Lilo, and she's almost afraid. She doesn't want to turn around, but she does, and she sees Ava. She sees Ava Kassira, this girl that she knew when was from school, and Ava says to her, do you have a place to stay? And my mom shakes her head. And Ava says, come to my house tonight. Maybe my mother can help you. And Ava hands her a piece of paper with the address, some money, the bus fare, and mom takes it. Next slide, please, Amy. The next slide should be coming up. And what you are going to see there is a picture of Ava, the young girl on the left, her mother, Hannah Zutschek, in the middle, and the house where they lived on the right. They were an extremely wealthy mother and daughter. Um, uh, the Casero was a very wealthy, wealthy family there. What they did was they gave my mother a false paper. She had a new name, a new identity. She worked in their house as a maid. It was a house that Nazis came in frequently. Mrs. Zuchek invited them for dinner. She had them, when people had no place to stay, they would stay there. She wanted my mom to stay away as much as possible, which mom tried to do, but it was difficult. The picture you see on the right, and you can see what it, the house was in Grunewald, which is in the western section of Berlin, in a very nice section. Um, when we, this was the house we went back and saw it in, in 2012, when mom and I went back to Berlin. So this picture was not taken up during the war, but when we went there, mom said it looked exactly like it was when she was there. On the third floor, you probably can see two little heads there um, out of, of the window. That is my mother and Ava um, looking, out, looking out the window. That window was very important while mom was there. Mrs. Zuchik did not want people to know that this maid had no place to live, that she really was a homeless person and asked too many questions. So every night, if there were guests staying there, my mother properly said good knob to any guests there, walked out with a little flashlight, and walked to an underground bunker that was on the grounds, and she could stay there and wait. And after what she guessed was an appropriate time, and walk out and gaze back at that third floor window. If the shutters were closed, it meant do not come back. It was not safe. It was only when Ava felt the guests were gone, or everyone was asleep. But Ava would open those, open those shutters, and Mom could return to that house. During this time, the Allies um, were bombing Berlin. There was so much destruction there. Many people were, thousands of people were homeless, and some pe many people came into that house for days, or sometimes even longer. During this time, um, my mother continued to see my father, not, not at the house, but at a predetermined place. So he would still, he, he knew where she lived, and my mother never knew where my father was in hiding. There was one day that my father does not appear at their meeting place. My mother has no idea why. 
she doesn't know whether her the worst that happened or if there was just too many Nazis on the street. We can't, it was the times that there was no communication. Later she finds out why my father did not meet her that day in February, and we're now in 1945. The reason he didn't come was that his father, who had heart problems, had died of a heart attack. Now, they were living in this very small room, 10 feet by 10 feet, and of course you cannot leave a dead body, a corpse in a small room. So what my father had to do was to wrap his father in a quilt. And in the darkness, he and Paul Casarius put my grandfather on a cart and they walked to the River Spray, which was just a few blocks away from their apartment in Eisenbahnstrasse. They walked in the middle of the night in the darkness through the snow and my father gently placed his father into the cold water. And they returned home. They, retur they feared being questioned and being stopped and being asked, what are you doing? Why are you out here? Unfortunately, no one stopped them. That night has plagued my father for the rest of his life. But of course, what alternative could you do? Could, what did you have? You could get no medicine. You could not go to a hospital. And you could not get a doctor to come to see you. This was February 1945. Three months later, the war is over. Next slide, please. It is 1945. Let's go back. One more, one more after that. It is 1945. War is over. And after the war, um, 55,000 Jews from Berlin were deported. And at that time, 1,400 emerged from hiding. And what I find incredibly amazing of that 1,400 number, three of them are my mother, my father, and my grandmother. I, I still find that amazing. The time after the war is a period of waiting. My mother is hoping that her brother will come back from the camps. She doesn't hold out much hope for her parents, but she does hope that her brother, who was young and strong, comes back. There is no no notice. I mean, people never tell you what happens. And we did not find out the truth until many, many years later. But what we did find out many years later is this. Um, <clears throat> Mom's parents, Bruno and Ella, were deported to Riga, the capital of Latvia. And, um, Riga was once a city with a thriving Jewish community, but all that changed when the Nazis occupied Latvia. A year before Bruno and Ella were deported, more than 25,000 Jews were taken out of Riga, marched to their own rural forest, forced to undress and stand at the edge of mass graves, where they were machine gunned down. When the train carrying Bruno and Ella came to a final stop, they, along with 722 men, women, and children, were shot and buried in that forest. Mom's brother, Hans Martin, was deported on February 26, 1943 in a closed cattle car that carried 912 people to Auschwitz. When the train stopped, 156 men and 106 women were selected for the Arbeitslager, a labor camp. The rest were murdered in the gas chambers at Auschwitz-Birkenau. So Hans Martin survived that first selection and many after that as well. He was a healthy, strong man and he was registered tattooed and became prisoner number 104435. The records from the International Tracing Service also have told me that Hans Martin was sent to the infirmary three times, which when I first read that I found so surprising to know that there was an infirmary at Auschwitz. Indeed there was, which again, thinking how people's lives were cheap, people were sent to the gas chambers, Yet, if a person had value, if they were a good worker, if for whatever reasons, and if their illness or their injury wasn't so bad, going to the infirmary could be a chance to regain some strength and continue working and continue to be alive. The records do show that Hans Martin was sent three times. Each time he was there, one week and then released. January of 1944, there are no more records after that, so I have no actual documentation of what happened. Yad Vashem just tells me that he was declared dead, but there is no date at death. 
So during this time of waiting, the years after the war, what happens then, I, um, my grandmother is able to get to America to get reunited with her older son, Gerhard. Hyas, the Hebrew Immigration Society, helped my grandmother and emigrate to America. My parents get married in 1947. And then the year later, in 1948, they also are able to come to America. And they are helped with JOINT, the American Joint Distribution Committee. This picture is just to show you life after the war. The picture on the top in the center, my mother is on the right, Gerhardt's in the middle, and his wife Miriam, Miriam Selden, a Trenton girl who he got married to, and then was, was a father of two young girls, my cousins, Judy and Barbara. But the three of them are celebrating New Year's Eve. They're drinking soda pop. It is December 31st, 1948, and I think it's just a lovely picture. My parents became citizens after five years, as soon as they were able to, and they wanted to do American things. The picture on the right is my father and grandmother on a circle line boat around Manhattan. The two pictures are on the bottom as of a family trip to Niagara Falls. And you can see me and my mother in our raincoats, and the other picture of my father and my mother also in their raincoats. The next picture that you will see is that taken in uh, 1972, it is um, the year when I graduate college. I graduated from Douglas College, and then it's also the year when I got married to Lenny in June of 1972. My father is in neither one of these pictures. My father died in February of 1972. He was 56 years old, died of a heart attack. He came to America and began taking work, taking jobs in a factory. After a few years, he got a job at the post office, saved money, bought two small apartment houses, worked extremely hard. My father loved classical music. He was excellent at math, and he loved me dearly. And his loss has left me, left me brokenhearted. So you see on that picture is my graduation, and I'm proudly standing there with my mother. And the picture on the right, you see my Uncle Gerhardt and Aunt Miriam, along with Lenny and me. And there is my mom, my bread and bread. Um, the next thing I want to share with you is an event that happened in 1988. It's actually the 50th anniversary of Kristalna. And my mom is invited to be the speaker at the Jewish Center to commemorate that event. That event is um, the, the, the slide before that, please. Right. The Prince, one more. That's it. The Princeton Packet wrote an article covering the event that held at the Jewish Center, where my mother was the speaker. Um, and she talks about her experience of seeing the synagogues on fire, seeing uh, the burning, the burning from the synagogue. And she talks of seeing people beaten, being beaten on the street. And she mentions, she, she talks about how she was saved by Eva Kassira and Hannah Zetchen. After, this, after that event, after the, that at the end of that evening, one of our congregants, Ruth Faith, a longtime member, comes up to me and says, Evie, I think I know somebody in Princeton, a professor in Princeton, who is related to the Kassiras. I look at Ruth and I, I feel that these stories are not connected. My mother's story in Berlin has nothing to do with Princeton today, but yet I listen. Indeed, Ruth was right. Professor Peter Perre at the Institute of Advanced Studies his mother is Suzanne Kassira. Suzanne Kassira and Ava Kassira are first, the first cousins, her fathers, her brothers. Professor Perre not only knew, the, was not just related, which of course he was, he knew the entire story about his cousin, his family, saving a Jewish girl, but they never knew her name. Or Peter, Professor Perre never knew her name and never knew what happened to her after the war. Um, and a few years later, actually, um, I want to talk to you about an event in 1995 when mom and I go back to Berlin. Germany tries to uh, make amends. I think one, one more back, please. Tries to make amends by, that's it, thank you, by inviting people who left Berlin for persecution to come back. My mother never wanted to go on such a trip. But then she decides it might be good, it would give me a chance to meet Ava. So in May 1945, 1995, excuse me, mom and I 
leave uh, for Berlin. Mom is carrying red roses. Ava is there to meet us at the airport. Both women are carrying identical red roses. They had exchanged cards and letters but had not seen each other for 50 years. It is a moment that you want to hold on to. You take a picture and that's about the best you can do. We brought pictures, we brought presents for Ava. I got to see the house her mom stayed in. And I got a chance to see a bit of Berlin. Berlin is filled with um, different monuments to remember, to mem commemorate the Holocaust. They have left the church, the memorial church um, that was destroyed during the war. In the next slide, you will see that the steeple of the church is, is, um, has been destroyed and, and has deliberately been left unrepaired. The picture on the left was the plaque at Rosa Hamburger Strasse. Now that was the old age home where her parents were taken before they were brought on, before they were deported to the camps or, or, or killed in Riga. Now um, that, that, that stone is actually a grave site. That is the last place that they were before they were killed. And what is on, um, on that stone, excuse me a second, it basically talks that 55,000 Berlin Jews were deported. And on the bottom, it says um, that never again to guard the peace and beware of war. And so this was a very emotional place and it allowed us to, just allowed mom to be at the last place that her parents were. After this trip to Berlin, I, I knew that I had to also write the story of my parents' survival and also honor the people who rescued my mother and my father. To, uh, to, to get somebody nominated as a Righteous Among the Nations, there's an application that needs to be sent to Yad Vashem and it needs to be corroborated by an independent source. Professor Pere knew the entire story, entire story and he kindly, wrote a, he kindly wrote an essay to corroborate our story of what happened. Yad Vashem accepted it and they did award um, the title of Righteous Among the Nations to Ava Kassira and to Hannah Zetcher. Unfortunately, um, both women had died by the time the award was, they, by the time um, Yad Vashem gave the award. Now, but we, we had the ascent ceremony in New York in May 2012. And on this picture, you will see my mother in the red jacket. Um, you'll see Professor Perret in the middle. And the man on the left is Gil Lanier. He's the, Israel, the, the, the representative from the Israeli consulate. The man on the right is Emil Jacobs, the representative from the German consulate. And this is the ceremony to honor the rescuers. On the right, you will see the medal that is given. It, it is a medal with the relief of the Hall of Names of Yad Vashem. It's hard to read it, but it says Hanazachek and Eva Kassira in the middle. And on the, on the side, it says, whoever saves one life saves the entire world. Now, you might think, well, what, what about the other rescuers? Have I forgotten about the Pisarius? Well, no, I have not forgotten about them, but I had no connection to them. I had no, nobody to, to connect with. So what do you do when you have no information? You began Googling things on the, on the internet. When I start looking for Pisarius, Eisenbahnstrasse, I came up with an article on, from the German um, paper, the, Hartsburg Chronicle, and it started out by saying, the article said, my Eisenbahn Strasse belongs to Paul Pisarius. And the article says, the old neighbor in house number 15, many times he has talked about the time he carried a dead man on a cart in the middle of the night, how he walked to the river and with the help of the dead man's son, they threw the body into the river. I sat, when I read those words, I practiced, I was stunned and angry. Here was my family's secret. This is what happened, but this is something that my family never talked about. And who was this Walter Schwab and how dare he write about this story and expose it on the internet? But of course, I soon realized whoever Walter Schwab was knew Paul Pisarius, knew the story, and I had to find Walter. Walter turned out to be a she. You'll see her picture in the middle. 
And I think she was incredibly surprised to hear from me. It took many years from the time the article first came out to the time I contacted her. And when we started corresponding, she said she was never sure that the stories were true, that, she, that Paul Pissarres would tell everybody. And he was an old man and people didn't believe him. They thought he was just making up the stories. Now she was a journalist and she, at that time she was a student and she was living there, lived on the fourth floor. But she liked him and she believed him and she wrote this article. And indeed she was shocked and happy and surprised when she heard from me. It was from Walter that, that I got those, that picture that you saw earlier of Paul and Lenny Casarius. And it was from Walter who told me about the room where they were in hiding because she knew the room. She, had, she knew the place. And from Walter, I learned so much more about Paul and Lenny Casarius. And when it was time to put the application in to honor them as the righteous among the nations, Walter also corroborated our story. So they were accepted. They were to be given the medal as the righteous among the nations. But my next problem was I had no relative. I had no one to give this medal to, this award to. More searching, more digging. Um, there's a wonderful museum in Berlin called the Museum of the Silent Heroes. The um, curator, the director there, helped me there to find, she actually found a nephew of Paul Pisarius. His name is Werner Pisarius. He in fact knew the entire story of his uncle. He and his uncle, they, they were, they had spent summers together and his uncle had always told him about what they did and about how, what happened when the old man died and what they had to do. So indeed, when I gave this, when he gave this award to Werner, it was not a stranger. It was a man who knew his uncle. For that award, we flew to Germany to Andernach, where Werner Versarius lived. At that time, Werner was a man of 96 years old. He was happy to receive the award for his family, and I was very happy to speak in German to him. I had been studying German first at Mercer County Community College and then at Rutgers um, for the past few years, probably for that one moment, so I could look him in the eye and talk to him in German and give him my deepest thanks for what his family did. The man behind, standing next to me is Emmanuel Michonne. He was the ambassador from, um, from um, Israel <coughs> to Germany, and he was there to present the award. And again, you can see the award, and there's my mom um, sitting there next to us. Um, next slide, please. Okay. That is the story, but I want to add a few more things if I can. As I said, this book came out, just came out in December of 2020. And I want to share this picture of my mom holding this book, which I was so thrilled. And after years of conversations and tapes and asking her questions, tell me again what street you lived on, tell me again about the schools and recording this and writing down that she could actually hold this book in her hand. And so there you can see mom holding it. Mom lived, um, as I said, she just passed away this past um, February at the age of 97. I want to share a few more pictures with you if I can. I want to let you know that my mom, the first picture on the left is me and mom riding our bicycles. To me, it's just a complete picture of happiness and of joy and the fact that a life could be rebuilt after the horrors of what happened to her, of losing her family, having nowhere to live, starting all over. You see a picture there of just joy of, of our riding our bikes. The picture on the right is a sad picture, as though it's, it's my daughter Amy, me and mom. Sadly, my daughter Amy passed away four, four years ago. She was 36. That picture is the last picture of the, of the three of us, and so it is incredibly special to me. Mom had a very good relationship with both her grandchildren, my daughter Amy, and my son Eric, and with her great-grandchildren. And on the next slide there, you can see mom, and you can see her on the right on the first picture with, with her grandson, my son Eric, and her great-grandson James. And the picture on the left is mom eating a bowl of ice cream with her two great-grandchildren, Josephine and Max. And the last picture to share with you is a picture taken two years ago when my son Eric and his wife Elizabeth and their three kids were at our house for the Passover Seder. So I thank you very much for letting me share this story. Oh, um, I'll tell you this in a second. My story was a story of survival, of courage, and of, uh, and of a lot of luck.
to getting through the worst of times. The picture, we can go to the next slide too, Janie. Um, many people have asked me about getting information. International Tracing Service was incredibly helpful with the dates of, of deportation, the trains, um, a lot of information. They have literally millions of documents there. So if people are looking to do research, um, the name has changed to the Arlson Archives. And I just put this out there because people have asked me about how to find information. So if you have relatives who were in Europe, they don't have, they could be in the camps or not in the camps. They are a great resource of information. And uh, I wanted to share that because that has come up in the past. So again, thank you very much for listening. And um, any questions that you have, I'll be happy to answer. Hi again, I'm back. Hi, well, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Yes, okay, let me put the slides down. Well, that was terrific. Um, we're getting lots of great comments here. Let's see, do we have any questions? Actually, that was just someone wanting to know if they were registered. Okay, um, if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat. Get people saying that they're really looking forward to reading this book and um, to thanking you for your amazing contributions and saying may no one ever have to be hidden again. And uh, we had people here from all over the place, which is wonderful, Pennsylvania and Ohio and New Jersey. Um, so what's your next project? I guess that's what I want to know. Are you going to be writing some more, doing more research, or just is this kind of, you feel like you've completed the journey now? Well, um, I'm not a writer. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a financial analyst. I'm more of a numbers person than a writer. So this was a challenge writing it. I think I've been more concerned about anti-Semitism in, in Germany and the U.S., but also I worry, um, obviously, right now what's happening in Israel, there's been a surge of anti-Semitism. But even before that, um, Angela Merkel is, has been a friend to Israel. She's been a supporter mm -hmm. of, um, uh, of Jews, and she's not going to run again. So there's going to be somebody else in her place. And I worry about the future of Germany. So I've tried to be a watchdog mm -hmm. and try to keep up with events going on there. So in terms of future, I don't know whether I'll be writing as much or just try to keep on top of what's going on. Okay. Oh, it seems like we have a question. Let's go see. Um, oh, so um, Lois wants to know, how did your parents meet in the first place? Oh, I guess, yeah. Good question. I forgot to mention that. So they met, they met, there was an organization called the Yudische Kulturbund. And I've talked about it, I forgot to mention it, which was the Jewish cultural organization. What it was when Jews could no longer work Many um, there were people, um, the Jews who were, were, who were um, in, in theater, actors, who were writers, who were musicians, were often employed by the state theaters in Berlin, and they also lost their jobs. It wasn't just uh, people who worked for the state, all those people, all, they all lost their jobs. Now, what happened, many of them came together through um, different means, and they formed the Yiddish Kulturbund, which was the Jewish cultural organization. And they put on plays and theater and, and concerts. Now, it was very interesting because the, the German government actually had to endorse it. And they did because it served as a great propaganda vehicle to say, hey, they're not being treated that badly. Look, they have their own symphony. They have their own plays. It was, it was all Jewish performers. The audience was only Jewish. The point of all that, my father went to many of these performances. He loved classical music. My mother was at a performance one night with her brother. She wasn't, and my father saw her. And he was attracted to her. And through that time, he went and approached her. They started talking. And they went out a bit. And this was a, probably in 1941. So before both, they had to go in hiding. So they met through the Yiddish Kulturban. There's a wonderful book called The Inextinguishable Symphony by Martin Goldsmith. His parents, his mother was a cellist, and his father was a violinist. And it's all about the uh, about this time. So if anybody's interested in that, it's a wonderful book. Okay. And do you know um, how much research is still being done to identify um, rescuers? Is that ongoing? Or because many of the rescuers are probably uh, passed away by now. So how is that working? Yeah, you, you um, there's been about 10,000 people who have been um, actually 10,000 stories, I think 27,000 people have actually, because of course each story could have more than one person who have the name wretches among the nation. And people can be given that title um, post-mortem. 
So it is still ongoing. If you look at these lists, you can you will see that they're still continuing. I think even now, um, throughout, and there are righteous people throughout the world. The biggest number is from Poland, which is not surprising because there were the most Jews who were killed in Poland. The biggest Jewish population there. There were actually there was four people from American from America who are given that title. One was Vivian Fry. And that's also a wonderful book about him. He was stationed in Europe and he came uh, at the station. He came to, he, Eleanor Roosevelt was involved trying to bring um, um, artists and writers, Jewish who were in, trapped in, in Germany to bring them over. And Vivian Fry was on this, was given this um, assignment. And he, it was a wonderful book about how he brought people over from, from Europe. I'm not forgetting the name. Vivian Fry is a name to look up. And it's a wonderful story. So yes, it's still ongoing. That's great. Yeah, I can imagine that um, you know Poland having that that kind of number and having been that way. Well, and it's and I think it's so special that you and your mom managed to get the awards while there was still somebody there to give them to personally, and that your mom could be there to thank the rescuers in some way who who allowed her and her husband to survive the war. I mean, that's just remarkable. And, and as you sort of pointed out, uh, Professor Ferre just died this past year. He died yeah. in September uh, 2020. He was, I think, 96 years old. So, but um, I was fortunate that there was he, he, he did the ceremony long ago at enough time, so he could accept it again. It was not a stranger; it was a person who knew the story. Werner was elderly. He died, I think, about a year after we did the ceremony. So, yes, the time going. With the, with the lots of time, not only are the rescuers gone, but even the people who had firsthand knowledge of them, they may not even be available, but it's still worth doing. So if somebody has somebody they feel they need, they want to rescue, go for it. Well, this has been uh, the perfect story for us to present at the library, a uh, local connection to an important era, um, tragic era, but an important era in Jewish American history. And I'm, I want to thank you, Evelyn, for coming on tonight to share you. your book with us and um, everybody who tuned in. And I really, you know, um, hope that I think it's also going to preserve history for the future, for our future generations. And that's really important to have these memoirs and these stories for um, the future. So your your hard work will, will live on and um, your parents' story will live on through you and the work that you did. Thank you. So, thank, thank you for, you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we're going to sign off for now. And uh, hopefully we will see you again in another library program. Good night, everybody. <laughs>